There she is. There she is. Hi, Ange. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Thanks. Pretty good. Thanks. Um, uh, one of the most important considerations of the environmental assessment is, is fish and wildlife. And we know this is an important topic to community members. Preserving the populations of fish and wildlife in their homeland is very, very important. So we want to talk about this and make sure people understand that that this is being studied in a lot of detail and I have I have many questions for for Ange. Um, Ange, thanks for joining us today and facing the onslaught of questions from me. Um, we don't have a lot of time and we got a lot of topics to cover but before we get started we want to show you a, a short video of uh, Leslie, a Webaquake community member and he's going to talk about um, the respect community members have for the land. So let's take a look at that clip right now and then we'll come back and start our conversation with Ange. Personally, they didn't even, uh, they, didn't, um, they didn't teach me how to hunt, but they taught me how to respect wildlife. And the thing they taught me is to, um, when you uh, see a dead animal, you um, offer tobacco. Back. Um, that's an interesting video. We've got a few of these videos that we're going to include throughout the uh, today's streaming session, which I think you should enjoy. It's the perspective of community members talking about uh, talking about their homeland. So, Ange, um, let's get things started here and let's talk about the migratory uh, waterfowl surveys. Uh, what's the purpose of these surveys sure. as part of the, the Webquay Supply Road Environmental Assessment, Ange? Um, well, the purpose of the surveys, um, specifically the, the waterfowl, is to locate um, the sensitive habitats that those birds are using because it's important to know where those are so that we can use that information in figuring out exactly where the road corridor will go and the only way to know that is to go up and do these surveys. Okay, and which species specifically of, of, of migratory waterfowl have have you been surveying as part of these surveys? Well, we're we're not targeting any particular species, but ones that um, we see in great numbers are tundra swans, um, lots of mergansers, mallard ducks, um, golden eye, um, things that aren't waterfowl that we also see during those surveys are uh, a lot of greater yellow legs and other um, wading birds. Um, there's another, oh, other ducks that we see a lot of are northern pintail. Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Those are the ones that really stand out. Um, oh, bufflehead, of course. So, you know, pretty much all the, the northern ducks, when, you know, when people think of northern ducks, that's exactly what we're seeing. Okay, this sounds, this is probably to you another crazy question from me, but um, how can you tell the difference between migratory and non-migratory waterfowl when you're doing the surveys, Ange? Well, yeah, I get this question actually quite a bit from people and um, all of them are migratory because um, right now, for example, today it's minus 35 in Webaquay. Everything's frozen solid. There's nothing there except for some of the hardy, um, birds like ravens, Canada jays, bald eagles that hang around all year round. But all the waterfowl are down south enjoying the heat and humidity that we aren't able to enjoy. <laughs> yes, because of travel restrictions. Yes, Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're exempt from the COVID restrictions, I guess. The, yes. Uh, yeah, the migratory <laughs> they, birds. They can come yeah. and go at will. <laughs> There's no, no borders, right? No borders. No, travel. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, what are the characteristics of the areas that you survey? Um, like, where are the best places to do these these types of surveys in the study area? Are you looking for a specific habitat type? Yeah, so we targeted, um, obviously, all the lakes and all the ponds. Um, 
along the road corridor and we also traveled north so downstream the Winisk River um, for approximately 50 kilometers north of um, the community of Webaque. And we traversed um, both sides of the river. So on our way north, we went up the right-hand side of the river and same thing on our way south, we went back because the river's pretty wide. So we want to make sure we cover everything. And, and then when we do see large flocks of birds, we'll tend to circle around them because it's really hard. Once they start, they hear us and they start flying. It's really hard to estimate how many there are. So we have to do a couple passes to make sure that we've um, captured as many of the numbers as we could possibly count. Okay, that leads me to my, leads me to my next question, which is how are the surveys done? How do you count uh, the birds so accurately? Because I can imagine you fly over areas and there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of birds sometimes. How do you do that? Yeah, well, everything's done by helicopter. Um, we don't get out on the ground and look, we just fly overhead. Um, when we do get really large flocks, the, like the hundreds of mallards, and they're usually mixed in, so there's all different species <laughs> all mixed in. So usually um, there's two or three of us on the helicopter, and we're all looking out opposite sides of the chopper, and we're just calling out the number of birds. And if there's that many, we'll estimate in tens. So, you know, instead of trying to count individuals, we'll just go, oh, well, there was... 10 or 20 mallards or 10 or 20 pintails you know to the best of our ability that's what we do um we often have to make more than one pass to make sure that we pick them up because some they go in all different directions as soon as they hear the helicopter coming coming and then we just go holy there's hundreds of ducks up ahead get ready and then we're kind of all over i find the one species that doesn't seem fussed at all by the helicopter are the tundra swans and they just kind of cock their head and look up at us like, hmm, you guys again. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you, do you ever land in different locations as part of the survey, or is it, is it pretty well mainly done by, by helicopter? Um, sometimes we land if there's a good place to land just to stop and have a look, and we make more detailed notes about the habitat conditions, but mostly we just um, stay flying overhead because we have a lot of ground to cover and in a short period of time to do it all. So how do you use the data that you collect in the environmental assessment? Well, the data is used, um, well, the waterfowl data is mainly used as a description of the habitat sensitivity. So depending on the species that are using it, and we make a determination um, of how long they might be using it, because all these birds are continuing to head north. Some of them will stick around because you can already see when you're flying over that some birds are paired up. So they're going to breed locally, but the vast majority are going up to the James Bay coast. So they're really using these areas, especially the Winesk, as um, a staging ground. And it's really important habitat. And we need to know, you know, generally the species numbers, like how many birds are using it. And we're only just making an estimate of how long they're sticking around because we come back a few times to do the survey. So we do it over the course of about a month and we come back three times. Excuse me. So yeah, it's just use um, the waterfowl is mainly from a habitat sensitivity purpose in the EA. Okay, let's move on to another topic, uh, the breeding birds surveys. Um, what is the purpose of these surveys as it relates to the supply road. So what, maybe tell us a bit about why that, that particular survey is being done. Okay, well, it's the same kind of idea. Um, I keep looping back to this habitat sensitivity thing. Um, with the breeding bird survey, um, I don't wanna say we're mostly focused on song, songbirds, but when we're doing point counts, it seems to be the species that we pick up the most because we're only there for a short period of time. And, um, some of the more cryptic species and the species that are typical to call um, in the evenings, we won't pick up in those surveys. Um, so the information from the breeding birds that we'll get, um, we'll get abundance, densities. Um, what are some of the other things? I was just talking to our modeler yesterday. It's mostly abundance and densities <clears throat> and um, from that, we'll be able to estimate 
dispersion and overall abundance across the landscape by using all of that data. Um, that's what that modeling specialist is doing for us. Um, so it's our job to make sure that we have a good enough spatial distribution of our um, sampling points so that it can feed into those models to get the information that we need for the environmental assessment. So Ange, what, what uh, species of breeding birds are you interest, are you most interested in surveying? You were saying songbirds is, seems to be what, you know, is focused on sort of ultimately, but it's not intentional really. Um, um, just give us an idea maybe of the species that, uh, that tend to be the ones that you uh, are, are focusing on when you do these surveys. Okay, well, the species that we hear the most of <clears throat> during our point counts are um, white-throated sparrow, ruby-crowned kinglet, Swainson's thrush, um, yeah, Canada geese, they're often flying overhead. Um, the ones that we really want to pick up and the ones that'll be the most, I don't want to say the most important, but they'll be the focus of um, the regulator, the agencies when we're doing the EA are things like all of side of flycatcher and um, Canada warbler, common nighthawk. So the the species at risk species, um, we try our best to get them as much as possible. And we were actually successful in hearing quite a few all of side of fly flycatchers last year, which was nice to hear. Um, I don't, that's a, that's a bird I don't hear very often. So uh, I was really excited when uh, we heard that. And same with Canada Warbler. You don't hear that one very often either. And you hear a lot of birds, Ange. You're yeah, a, I do quite a bit a of birding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, another question here for you. Do you do these surveys at a certain time of day? And, and when you, what, what time do you do these at? And, and why do you do it at that particular time of day? Yeah, so our breeding bird point counts are done early, early in the morning. Um, you can start them as early as half an hour before sunrise. Uh, we didn't get there that early because we had to travel by helicopter. So we would usually start the surveys around 8 a.m. And you can continue them for five hours after the sun rises. So it depends on what time the sun rises because it, it varies throughout um, the breeding period. And the reason why we do them that early in the morning is because they're most active then. So they're most active looking for mates or defending their territory or that kind of thing. And they're singing and calling away and, and going crazy. And once the, the day, you know, it gets later, they, they tend to, to get quieter. They get more vocal again in the evening, but definitely the morning they're more, they're the most active. So how, how, how do you actually do the surveys? You go to these locations and then what happens, what happens next? Okay, so we get dropped off at our locations and um, in each point count um, cluster, I guess is what we call it, we do 10 or 11 uh, individual survey points. So we go to our first point, we, um, you know, take out our survey sheet and all that jazz. And I set my timer for 10 minutes because you're supposed to go 10 minutes. And on each survey sheet, you have to record the birds you hear in the first minute, at three minutes, five minutes, and then in the last 10 minutes. So you have to kind of keep a general watch of your timer to see where you are. And I just sit there really quietly listening intently for, um, as many birds as you can possibly hear. And sometimes it's very overwhelming when you first arrive, you have to kind of sit and <laughs> orient yourself and, you know, look at the habitat you're in. And then it, it, it sort of like works in your brain, like, okay, well, I'm more in a, you know, I'm in an open bog. These are the species that I'll generally see or hear. I should say here, we hardly ever see them. I, I think last year, I barely use my binoculars at all. I could have really gone without them. It's all by ear. Wow, that's amazing. It's, um, are, there, are there certain areas where birds like to breed or does it really depend on the species and their preferred yeah, habitat? Yeah, every species has their favorite habitat. So um, you get to know what you're gonna, you kind of have an idea what you're gonna hear before you get there, but we're often surprised. We're like, oh, they popped in. You know, for example, 
you'll find Canada jay almost everywhere. And that species is really funny. I love it because you can't really look for them. They come looking for you. It's almost like there's a, I don't know, somebody sends up a signal to the Canada jays that all oh, these people are here. And the next thing you know, you know, four or five of them will pop over and check it. They get really close. They're super curious. They're my favorites for sure. What what info do you record when when you're uh, doing the counts of these birds? Uh, you're so you're you're standing or sitting there and listening. What do, what do you record? Um, we record the time that we started, um, the wind. There's um, a way to calculate in general. It's the Beaufort scale, and obviously the temperature, um, and then the primary habitat that you're sitting or standing in and then the secondary habitat. So you could be a tree bog is kind of like your main habitat. And then you're sitting around, I don't know, you're just sitting in amongst a bunch of little black stunted black spruce or something like that. Tell us about these acoustic recording units that you're using for the surveys. Okay. Yeah. So we're using these acoustic recording units. They are damage. really, Can you hear me? I think we've lost connection with uh, Ange. So maybe what we can do is let's uh, let's go to a video. Let's go to a video, uh, maybe um, a video that talks about the hopes of uh, uh, community members, Webacoy community members. I think you'll like this video. Aspirations of community members. So we're gonna we're gonna cue that up in a. In a second here, and get back, get Ange back uh, on the line. It looks like uh, something. They're at the 11 minute mark in the third period. Maple leaf special, red wings, Face off will be in the leaf zone at this end. red wings, You can hear them. Russell, where's Abel? Maple leaves. For me, like my son will be in high school next year and well, me and my husband were talking about it still like it might be best for him to go to high school in Thunder Bay or anywhere instead of here because he don't have an arena and he wants to skate. Actually the old community of Webekwe used to be a gathering place uh, where all of the different uh, families while they were out during the winter came back to uh, the community uh, which was traditionally known as Kish uh, that was a preview of a uh, of the aspirations of community members uh, video. Uh, you can find that on our website. Sorry about that. We we lost Ange there for a minute, but uh, Ange, uh, do we have you back? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good. Okay, good. We're, we're good, back. Good. We're we're ready to go again. Okay. Here's another question. Here, I I hear you guys talking about these acoustic recording units um, that you use as part of this work. Can you tell us a bit about these things, what they do, and you know what what's the purpose of them? Okay, so the ARUs are um, something we use as a supplement to um, our point count surveys and the waterfowl surveys and everything else we do. Um, it we're using them to record birds and other vocal wildlife. So if there's frogs around and anything else that might make a noise, um, we've got them placed all over um the study area and we move them around fairly often um we have to replace the sd cards and the batteries and we move them all over to make sure that we cover off all of the habitat okay here's another follow-up question here how do you understand from the recordings on these devices which birds are which and, and what what tools do you use to to figure that stuff out yeah, so we get a lot of data. So we run it through um, a software program that filters out um, first all the extraneous data. So all the wind noise and 
Um, we were also using them when we were doing the point count. So it'll filter out like our noise of rustling around and stuff like that. And, um, and then the software learns what the bird calls are. So they're able to sort through it, but there's still a lot that they can't sort through for various reasons. I don't know, maybe the call was too quiet or it was too far away. So we actually have to hire some um, younger avian biologists who will sit and listen to hours and hours and hours of <laughs> ARU <laughs> data. That sounds exciting. Ange? It does actually. I think it sounds. Yeah, you could do that. You could. You'd be willing to do that. You'd volunteer yeah, for would. that, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, okay, let's move on to another topic uh, that community members will be interested in, and that's um, species at risk. Um, and uh, community members often hear the phrase "species at risk" coming from probably more from government agencies and and also from consultants. Um, what exactly are species at risk? What does that mean exactly? Well, when you hear species at risk, it's just referring to those species that are in danger of disappearing um, and have threats facing the habitat they live in or um, the species themselves. So it's just kind of like a general overview of that. So how is conducting fish and wildlife species at risk surveys important to the Webequay environmental assessment? Well, it's important to know where they are because they are at risk. So we need to know exactly where their habitat is, um, how many individuals there are and how they're using it and, and all of that type of thing. So in the environmental field surveys done in and around the community over the last few years, which, uh, which species at risk have you, have you seen? Give us some idea of, of, of some of the ones that you've seen. Well, we've seen quite a few. Um, the boreal caribou, the wolverine, um, all of side of flycatcher, Canada warbler, um, and the one we saw this past year was common nighthawk. We kind of knew we, they were in the area. We figured they were. We'd never seen them before, but we did see quite a few last year. Hmm. And lake sturgeon, of course. Oh, we didn't lake. see them in our surveys, but we know that they're there yes. based on what community members are telling us. Yes, we hear a lot about Lake Sturgeon, don't we, from, mm -hmm. from community members. So can an observation of wildlife species at risk include animal tracks as well? Like if if community members were to see tracks of, of, of a species at risk, can they report them to you as well as the, as the location of, of these yes. tracks? And, and, and when they do, what information should they provide or what would you, what would be really helpful to you? Um, if they're going to report tracks, uh, just a date would be nice. Um, it doesn't time of day. If they, if they have that information, um, whether or not they thought the tracks were fresh or if they're old, um, maybe if they can figure out what direction they're going in or like what habitat they came from, you know, were they walking out off of the Island onto the ice or, you know, vice versa, that type of thing. Did it look like it was, you know, if it was a Wolverine, did it, Look like it was coming from a den or you know was it could you tell it would if it's a wolverine was it dragging prey like any kind of information um is important for us and like even the smallest little tidbit is useful so um i think there might be a uh, an image on the screen of a bat um so on that topic um you're doing some special species at risk work for for bats um Maybe yeah. can you tell us a bit about that? I think it's pretty interesting, and I think our viewers will be uh, would like to hear about that. Yeah, so we're doing um, some work with bats again using the ARUs, but instead of um, because bats don't really make sounds that we can hear, um, it picks up the electrosonic calls that the bats make when they're that they send out when they're looking for um, bugs. So we put those um, in specific areas pretty much only in areas with deciduous trees because that's where bats generally roost. And as everybody knows, there's not that kind of that, not that much habitat or within our study area. So um, we kind of move our units within the small little, um, like the little bits of deciduous trees that are scattered around the, the study area. 
Okay, let's step back a bit now to maybe talk more generally. Tell us maybe some of the species at risk observations that you've made during the field surveys that you've you've done so far. I mean, you've had some pretty uh, you know interesting observations that I've heard about. So maybe you can tell our viewers a bit about those. Well, we've seen lots of caribou during our aerial surveys. Um, 2019 was the last time we did the aerial surveys. We saw wolverine also during that point. Um, one of our pilots actually saw a wolverine. The rest of us only ever saw the tracks. We didn't, we missed the actual animal. Um, it's funny, all those biologists in a helicopter and the pilot. I know, and the pilot picks it up. Yeah, <laughs> so frustrating. Um, and like the other ones I said, the, the olive-sided flycatcher, um, Canada warbler, common nighthawk. And we haven't seen any lake sturgeon yet, but um, we know that they're there. So what what about the Webequay area makes it unique or special when it comes to uh, species at risk, would you say? Well, it, the whole area is in the boreal forest, and that boreal habitat is very important um, for so many species. It's largely untouched. Um, for birds, it's the, the nesting hotspot for a lot of our songbirds, like all over the world. If you look at the boreal forest in general, all in, in the north around the globe, um, it's extremely important in Canada for over 150 species of birds. Um, it's also vitally important for caribou and wolverine. Um, those two species are super sensitive to disturbance and they require large tracts of undisturbed habitat to, um, you know, for caribou, for, for calving, because they're moving around all of the time, looking for food and they're not stationary, they're on the go constantly. And, and wolverine also require large tracts of, they have huge territories um, for each individual animal. So the whole thing is really important on so many levels. Okay, let's move on to another topic. Let's, um, in fact, it's another species at risk, uh, Boreal caribou. Um, this is a, it's also known as woodland caribou. Um, maybe before we go any further, let's let's have a look at a short video of I believe it's Samson from Webequay um, talking about uh, boreal or woodland caribou. So let's watch that quickly, and then we'll come back and continue our conversation with Ange. So uh, Samson, when when do you normally see caribou? Uh, in the winter or, or in other seasons? Uh, usually during the winter time. I remember you told me once that there, there's a route that they run, they usually run through, like a pathway that they run through? Oh yeah, there is. There's a path, um, you know, where the, um, where the uh, winter road starts, that crossing there, there's a, like a path, kind of looks like a skittle path right now, skittle trail path right now. Uh, that used to be the old uh, caribou path. Samson, how are how are caribou different from moose? Like, how are their habits different? How are their habitats different? Are they bigger or smaller than moose? Uh, caribou are quite smaller than the moose. So Samson, is there a specific time of the year when caribou hunting is done? Most people prefer during the winter because during the summertime, um, I guess the caribou um, has, you know, a different appetite during that time. And people would notice the taste and they would prefer um, the winter season to harvest the caribou because they don't taste as bitter as during the summertime. Well, we're back. I hope you enjoyed that uh, that brief clip uh, talking to Samson about uh, caribou. We've got a few of quite a few of these, and they're really interesting and and gives our viewers you know a lot more insight into um, into you know fish and wildlife in the community as well as other subjects as you'll see coming up. So, Ange, uh, back to my uh, questions here. What was the purpose of the winter caribou survey that was done for the, the Webquay Supply Road? Can you tell us maybe? Uh, why that was done and and uh, then i'll get into some questions about how it was done sure so uh we do the winter aerial survey to 
kind of as an inventory of the winter presence of caribou and identifying their overwintering habitat and, you know, the proximity of those animals to the actual road corridor. Um, because their winter habitat's a lot different from where they they um, tend to be in the summertime. Okay. So maybe we can step back on this a bit as well. And, and I understand there's different types of caribou in Ontario and even different types of boreal caribou. Um, can you maybe tell us a bit about the differences and, and, and which ones specifically live in, in the Webequay Supply Road uh, area? Yeah, it's confusing because they recently changed it. So they were previously known as woodland caribou, but now they're just straight up caribou. So there's two different. So there's the boreal caribou, which are the ones that are around Webequay. And then the eastern migratory, which are, um, no, sorry, I'm mixed up. The boreal caribou are in the tundra. And then the ones that are in the Webequay area are the eastern migratory caribou. Oh, yeah, that's and that's the change you're talking about, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. It's still confusing for me. <laughs> anyway, um, in the wintertime, they kind of tend to mix in a little bit. So, um, you can't tell by looking at them which is which, but um, yeah, you'll you'll get a little bit of mixture in the winter time, and then in the summer, the um, the boreal caribou will stay north in the tundra. Okay, uh, how do you conduct these surveys, Ange? I know you've done a few of these things, and and is there a certain, for example, is there a certain time of year um, where these are done during the winter, uh, or a certain set of weather conditions that have to be present at the time when you do the survey maybe you can give us some some details like that sure so uh the winter aer aerial surveys are generally conducted february 1st to march 15th um ideally you would conduct them shortly after um you know a couple of days after a snowfall so that you're seeing their tracks like really fresh tracks um you need bright clear conditions so that it's easier to actually see the tracks when you're flying overhead because um cloudy days um it makes for really flat light and it's hard to pick up the tracks um the helicopter's flying about 100 to 200 meters high so we're pretty low and it's flying about as slow as the pilot is comfortable going so anywhere from 80 to 100 kilometers an hour it seems fast, but when you're actually in it, you can tell it's pretty slow. So is and we just fly along like transex. So, you know, the transex could be 50, 30 to 50 or 100 kilometers long, and you get to the end and you turn and you come back down another one and you so just keep like going straight back. straight lines, right? So yeah. Those transex, straight lines, and then turns around and comes yes. back. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I, they're spread out, I forget how far, kilometer or two kilometer from each other. But there's there's a lot of these lines. Oh, there's remember, a lot. Right? Yes, there's um, anywhere from fifty to seventy five transects. That so we flew. is the survey work pretty well all done from a helicopter, or do you sometimes maybe drop down to the ground to investigate things like tracks, maybe? Um, everything's done by the air. I know the a couple times we did touch down because we saw Wolverine tracks, so we wanted to get some better pictures of those. But generally, we keep flying only if anybody's has an interest in in dropping down, and then then we'll do that. But the snow is really deep, so it's really hard to walk. Yeah, it's deceiving, right? You don't realize until you step out and you go, "Ugh, this is up to my thighs. I don't want to walk this." And then you regret forgetting your snowshoes, right? Exactly. <laughs> What information do you do you record when when you see caribou? So when you're doing these surveys, what are you recording? Um, we're recording obviously numbers, um, whether they're male or female, if any are calves. Um, what else? Uh, we're looking for areas that they've been congregating in, or they've been um, pawing the ground looking for lichens, and that's called cratering. So we're looking for those types of things and that's kind of what we look for are the crater areas and then you can see all their tracks leading away from that and you follow the tracks and then oftentimes you'll find the herd. I know you've done uh, as I mentioned before uh, previous winter caribou surveys in the area. Um, what did you see when you did those surveys and how big were, were the herds that, that you saw? 
Well, the herds aren't huge. Um, they're usually about seven to 15 animals, um, sometimes smaller. I think maybe one of the herds we saw was a little bit bigger, but yeah, I was kind of surprised. Um, they're not, they're not super huge herds. They're not those big herds that, you know, you would see in a movie of hundreds and hundreds of animals. You know, it's interesting though, Ange, we've also heard this year from community members that the, the herds are bigger than they have been in previous years and bigger than they've been in maybe the last 10 years. So, you, you know, oh. it's interesting, the patterns and, and, and their yeah. movement too is not always the same every year, is it? No, exactly. Yeah, it varies. Yes. Are there certain areas though, like where they like to be in the winter? Um, they like to be, we see a lot of tracks on lakes. They hang around the edges. Um, they like to get up into sort of more, well, as rocky of an area as there are, wherever um, lichens will grow. And that's what they're after, is that, because that's their main food source in the winter time. So they're pretty much going from spot, 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 looking for things to eat. So they'll just dig it out, I guess, eh? They'll, they'll yeah, just dig yeah. through the snow to get to the lichen. Yeah, because yeah, okay. their hooves are pretty big um, yeah. to help them travel on snow, but it also helps them digging as well. Hmm. Okay, we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to go to a short video uh, with Leslie, a Webaquake community member, talking about how the meat harvested uh, from animals such as moose is shared with uh, community members. I think you'll find this interesting. So let's, uh, let's go to that video now. I think, do we have it up? Okay, we're gonna go to that video now. We'll continue our conversation with Ange afterwards. We prepared a moose meat and we um, share with um, the, um, the whole community and especially the unfortunate ones, people that don't have um, access with um, boats uh, or uh, in the um, hunting ge gear and people that don't have um, hunters in their homes such as um, single single moms it's very important because um, it's in our um, it's in our blood to um, share our uh, food and that's what um, keeps our community alive. Great, we're back, continuing our conversation with Ange. Um, Ange, while we're talking about caribou, I understand the team will be doing another caribou survey very soon. Can you tell us mm -hmm. a bit about uh, the survey? Sure, so our team will be once again heading north shortly um, towards the end of February. Um, doing a caribou collaring survey. So that will be basically identifying the habitat used through caribou movements. Um, so we're going to put, why well, I say we, I'm not going, but they're going to be putting a GPS collar on 30 female caribou and we will be able to track their movements um, throughout over the course of three years, the collars will stay on for a total of three years. And we will return next winter to do what's called a recruitment survey. So we'll be looking to see which of those female caribou um, successfully had babies who calved. And we'll be able to follow, the, know where they are by tracking the um the collar so when they're they'll be able to find them a lot easier than normal and then they'll be able to the idea is we uh see which of the female caribous actually had calves and which of those calves are still alive wow that's interesting so you, it helps yeah. identify where the nursery habitat is as well yes exactly yes. so the, the overall thing we're we're trying to just you know figure out the abundance and the distribution across across the whole study area Okay. And just see how they move and where they go. And then, it, you know, so that gives us a lot of information when we're trying to position the road corridor. Areas to avoid. Yes. Yes. That's, uh, that's interesting. I, and I understand that there's another survey that's, uh, that's actually started today, isn't it? Um, it this is, This one's yeah. about Wolverine. Maybe, maybe you can yeah. tell us a bit about this one. Okay. So the, um, we're doing what's called a Wolverine occupancy study. So 
we're not going to be collaring them. We're not going to be trapping them. It's just um, a survey to um, try to identify where the wolverines are within the study area. And we do that using um, baited cameras, camera traps. So they're called camera traps, but that's all it is, is taking pictures of the wolverines. So we use these wooden devices called run poles. Um, they're attached to trees and the wolverines have to climb up it onto the platform and they walk through, a, I don't know what you call it, like a, two upright wooden poles and um, with some alligator clips attached that will be able to grab some of their hair so that we can take that as samples to do some DNA analysis, see who's male or female or if the female's pregnant, for example. We'll get that kind of information. And uh, there'll be a bait station hanging right above the platform. So the idea is that the Wolverine has to reach up and grab it. And then the camera will take a photo of the Wolverine. The best way to distinguish one Wolverine from another is by um, their chest. So obviously you'll be able to tell a female from a male. And they have very, um, they all have, I don't know, what do you call it? Um, different colorations of the fur. And so we can get to know which wolverines coming to the station and whether there's more than one individual. And so those will be kept out for two years and we'll be replacing the bait. So they'll only be used in the winter time and we'll be replacing the bait. Um, I believe it's three times over, um, well, next year will be January, February, March. So this year, just February and March. Well, that's, that sounds like a really interesting, uh, program yeah there. and yeah, uh, we should also know too we've got community members that will be uh do handling um sort of the maintenance the day-to-day -day, uh, uh part of of that survey as well too going to each of the 25 different locations and uh in and rebating the stations collecting the memory cards and uh and just making sure everything's the cameras are are set up still properly so um mm -hmm. That'll, that's a that's a big activity for community members, isn't it, Ange? It is, yeah. So we're relying on them pretty heavily for that aspect. Um, and we're very grateful that they're willing to do that and to donate the bait too for um, yes. for these camera traps. Yeah, no, that's 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 great. Um, well, let's move on to uh, to fish. That's a big topic uh, in the community and and maybe, um, Let's have a look at a short video right now um, of, I believe it's Samson talking about fish in the community and, and talking sp more specifically about which species community members like to fish for. So let's, let's have a that, look at that video and we'll come back and continue with uh, Ange. Which species do community members like to fish for? What are the ones that community members like? Basically, Walleye, sucker, whitefish, sturgeon, and pike are the main uh, fish. Where do your community members go fishing? Do they fish all over Weatherquay traditional lands? Um, they fish all over, all over the area, and sometimes uh, specific um, sites for different seasons. So. Do community members do a lot of ice fishing? Uh, that's one of the favorite things that the community members do. At least a few, uh, a dozen people every day. Uh, do community members fish from the shoreline or, or mainly from boats? Um, both. Yeah, certain areas they would uh, go on shore and fish from there. Okay, I hope everyone enjoyed that video. That's uh, some pretty interesting information on uh, fishing in Webequay and, and some of the more popular species in Webequay. Let's talk now about one of the fishery surveys that's being done for the project, um, the Spring Spawning Survey. Uh, Ange, I know you've been involved in this. Can you maybe tell us the purpose of the spawning survey? Sure, so the spawning survey again is just to um, gather additional information from what we normally would do because 
in general, you know, we would do um, habitat assessment and fish community surveys. And the spawning survey is just to figure out, well, we already know which species are there, but is to figure out, you know, the more sensitive locations. Um, we've targeted some of our spawning survey areas um, for locations that might have um, bridge crossings so that we get a better idea of where the sensitive habitat is. And it always goes back to that, you know, so that we can avoid it. Um, you know, we can talk to the engineers when they're talking about where they might want to place um, a crossing structure. And we can say, well, it, you shouldn't put it there because that's an important spawning area for walleye or lake sturgeon or, you know, something like that. So, and which types of fish um, or species of fish uh, did you survey as part of the, as part of this work? Well, we didn't really um, survey for specific ones. Um, we were kind of targeting walleye and lake sturgeon um, and suckers as well. How did you de determine the locations to conduct the survey? Did did community members have input on? on the locations for the survey based on just their knowledge of the land? Yes, so we asked community members first um, locations that they would recommend um, because they know the land. And um, that's where we actually placed uh, our survey stations was exactly where they recommended. Um, we had a look at the habitat when we were flying over and determined that yes, <laughs> those, make sense and those were the ones we chose. Um, we chose five different locations as our um, survey stations. And I guess those were spread out over over the study area, were they? Yes, they were spread over. So we were close to the community and then when we were, we were as far away as the Mukatai River. Okay, okay. So how did you collect the collect the eggs and, and, and what equipment did you use in in collecting those eggs? Good question. So we use these things called egg mats. Um, they're basically rectangular metal, I don't frames. know what you want to call it, frames, so thank you. And um, we covered them with furnace filter. Um, and we put five of these frames together as a gang and we drop them down into habitat in the rivers where it would be ideal for spawning for the different species, it's usually in the faster flowing water. Um, I think we put out a total of 75 egg mats um, over these five survey locations. And how long did you leave those egg mats uh, in the water? Um, it varied, but it was anywhere from two to three weeks. We didn't want to leave them in too long because um, if you read other studies and in our past experience as well, you realize that um, the uh, any eggs that might get uh, attached to these are easy for predators to uh, come along and just pick off. So we wanted to leave them in long enough so that they would get eggs attached, yet not too long that they'd all get preyed upon. So after you collected the eggs, what did you do with them? How did you get, get them off the, the egg mats? And, and then what happened after that? Okay, so the when they were pulling up the egg mats, they had to look through them very carefully because um, the eggs are really small and uh, difficult to see. And, you know, the egg mats are covered in um, aquatic plants and other detritus and stuff. So they have to carefully take all of that off so that none of the eggs are dislodged. And then they actually did find eggs. They put them in um, a preservative and into little um, vials, and then they were sent off to the University of Guelph for uh, ID and DNA analysis. So that was kind of part of my next question. How do you tell the difference between eggs of different species of fish? Yeah, it's kind of hard. Um, sturgeon eggs are black and are very small. And walleye eggs are much lighter in color and they're a little bit bigger. Um, but sucker eggs are also very similar to walleye. So it's really hard to tell when you're in the field, which is which. So um, they were just placed into the various vials based on the location and the, you know, the ID number of the egg mats. 
and it just sort of general descriptions were taken in the field, but it was, it's hard to tell what species is what. Wow. You did well, Ange. Lots of questions there and, uh, <laughs> and lots of great answers. So, um, you know, this is an important topic, I think, as our viewers will, will see or have seen. Um, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, we could, we could do multiple uh, streaming sessions on, on fish and wildlife for sure. Oh, and yeah, I could talk your ear off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you have before, Ange. I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe what we'll do now is go to some uh, viewer questions that we've gotten. Um, we've got one here from YouTube, Ange. Um, hi, my name, my family is from uh, Winisk First, First Nation, Pawanak. Will the studies and updates be shared with our community? Absolutely. Um, everything will be shared with all of the communities within um, our area. I mean, Don can speak to that better than I can, but I know, yes, that Pawanak is definitely one of the communities on the list where everything will be shared and we'll be um, compiling all of the information into a natural heritage baseline study. So it'll include not every, like including fish and wildlife, but it'll also be vegetation as well. Wow, that's great. We've got a few other questions here that we've gotten via email. So maybe I'll start with one here. Um, are there any dangers or risks involved to a person or animal during these studies? Um, well, I mean, okay, if we talk about danger to people, of course, uh, some of the work that we do, there is inherent danger. Um, we complete really detailed health and safety plans, and we go over all of the risks involved in the project, whether it's falling when you're walking in the bog, like falling through into a string bog. Um, to getting slapped in the face by a branch like something small like that or if they're in a river slipping on a rock and falling in so all of these things are covered in our health and safety plan and we have measures to reduce that as much as possible so um everybody's very careful in the field we're all looking out for each other um i mean there's dangers too with a helicopter but we're all very cognizant of how to be work safely around a helicopter in and around that kind of vehicle um and i mean not to say like for example last year somebody did slip and fall into a string bog and you we only went up to our thighs but i mean everybody works in a team and so we were able to pull that person out and it wasn't really that big of a deal but those kind of things are all reported and we learn from these um, little things that happen every once in a while and and that keeps everybody more safe as we keep going in the program. That's great. Good. Well, thank you for that, Ange, and, and thanks for, for joining us today. There's a lot of, a uh, ton of, of really helpful information, I think, and I, I, think, um, I think we'll be revisiting this topic in the very near future. So uh, I'd just yeah. like to thank everyone for tuning in today and and as I mentioned earlier, we'll be doing these live streaming sessions weekly on Wednesdays, now at 12.30 p.m., so a little bit later than before, um, focusing on different topics. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, another big topic, socioeconomics and gender-based analysis. And, uh, you know, for more information, we have a, there's a lot more information available at our website, supplyroad.ca, and uh, via, and you can contact us via email or text or you or through social media. I think our team has a social media um, contacts that they can put up on the screen for everyone. Um, our website has fact sheets. Uh, we've got a newsletter you can sign up for. Um, we have podcasts with uh, subject matter experts, different specialists in, in, in different areas. Uh, uh, there's a lot of information there and you know feel free to contact us if you need any further information um thanks everyone for joining us this week we're going to see you again hopefully next week on wednesday at 12 30. stay safe and healthy and uh, we'll see you again next week thanks for joining us